Makes me happy to see this guy's face unendingly confident uh, the way that he played. Uh, look at how happy Tony is. I that, love Deion Waiters. I mean, Absolute I, so, bucket. What up, Deion? I, I mean, people love What's up? How you doing? People how you love doing? the Deion Waiters style of play. Deion Waiters <laughs> loved the Deion Waiters uh, style of play. He's on the comeback uh, tour, and I want to talk to him about that in a second because it can be real hard when an athlete – uh, leaves behind some of his identity. The grieving process is very difficult and can be hard for a young person to experience when you have played basketball your entire life and been great at basketball your entire life. Uh, enjoyed watching you in Miami. Some of the most fun we had was when you were going, I think it was 31-11 and 11 toward the second half of the season that got everybody contracts, made Pat Riley crazy. Uh, is that the most fun you've had playing basketball? Or where and when would you say was the most fun you've had playing basketball uh i would definitely say that's one of them, one of my best moments as far as as far as being a pro and um just being able to come into a situation where you know i was given the opportunity to go out there and finally get a chance to play my game you know like coming in my first five or six years you know i played with great players you no know, Kyrie, Rudd. i played with Kyrie, brian kevin love kd um serge russ and then again, it's like when I got a chance to finally get to Miami, I was, you know, like I ain't really had no cuffs on. So it was like coming into a situation where I was finally being able to get like an opportunity to just go out there and play basketball and just basically like do what I, do what I wanted to do and have the opportunity just to take like big time shots or things like that. Basically like coming into where they like, it was like my team. I make you pick one moment from your time with the heat one and only one you're only i'm thinking of one but i don't know which one you might pick yeah <laughs> uh honestly i would have to say my favorite one of my favorite moments was when we was down 18 against brooklyn and we had that 18 point comeback in the fourth quarter i would definitely say that was one of my finest moments I know everybody's going to say the shot against Golden State, but that was just one of them. It was like, you know, it was cool, but I like I like the fight in us just being down by 18 and just having that fight and that will just to come back and keep the winning streak alive. And um, I think that was my finest moment. I have that pose. As- I have that pose you struck against Golden State on a T-shirt. <laughs> I was going to ask him if he's got that picture in his house. Like there's in your house somewhere is is you posing after making that shot with your arms crossed. Correct? That's nah, you know. No, nah, it was so crazy. I really don't got that. I had I had the t-shirts, of course, like from the heat when they made them, but I ain't get that. I ain't get that frame yet. That's 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 in the works. What have you made uh, since you were teammates with Kyrie Irving of the last few years of uh, his wandering? Uh, honestly, he, he didn't act like that when we first got in this together. Like, you know, he, of course he was a, a year before me, but when I was with him, he wasn't, you know, the, like the stuff that he, that, you know, he preaches about and the thing that, you know, his religion and just, you know, different things right now, he didn't, you know, that wasn't the Kyrie that I knew. So it's like, I'm glad that, you know, if you want to say like he found himself or he just got deep into his religion and. You know, just a guy, you know, I don't know, man. Just always been, like, you know, different. Um, he always been smart. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just sit down and get a chance to reflect on life. I guess that's what he he did. I don't, I don't know. I haven't really talked to him about, you know, those things and, like, what he went through as far as, like, just being able to, you know, find, like, find him true self. Can you tell us something about LeBron that we don't know, something that might surprise us? That y'all don't know about LeBron. Um, I mean, he loved to play Madden, like me. You know, he played Madden a lot, all day, every day. He played Madden all day, every day. Like, like we got practice. He might, he might play three or four games before practice, then after practice or after a game, he might be up all night just playing Madden. So. I don't know if I know that about Brown, but he's a big Madden fan like myself. So what's the cra- what, what's the craziest that you've seen uh, any of your teammates get about competition, whether it's Madden, gambling on a plane, anything else, away from the court? The craziest, um, I would definitely say 
I would definitely say gambling. Boo Ray. I never played Boo Ray. I just always used to watch. And it was like a lot of, you know, trash talking. But, you know, sometimes, you know, the, you know, when there's big money on the line, the cards game, they can no, get a little No, but tell us, tell us, tell us one of the stories. Give us, give, paint a picture for us on one, in one of the aggressive card games. Like, what are, what are we talking about the amount of money being thrown around? Uh, I would definitely say OKC, um, KD, Rush, um, a couple other guys, but I don't know. I think the amount was probably, you know, 30, 30, 30, 40,000, something crazy like that. And then, and, and, and in that range, and that's that, that, but that's where the fights start, correct? Once you get into that area, once oh that's... no, yeah, it get, it get a little aggressive. It get a little aggressive. It get a little aggressive, and um, you know, a lot of times, you know, guys like us, man, you know, we talk trash. So it's like we would be on the plane, just you know, just start talking trash, you know, going back and forth at each other, and the guy be losing, and then you know, we all making money. So it's like it'd be like a money conversation, I guess. I don't know. Who would you say, who would you regard, if I was doing top trash talkers with Dion Waiters, if I wanted a top five list from him, who during your career would you say is is somebody who might be able to get into it with you in a way that, uh, you know, might bother you a little bit? KD, for sure. Kevin Durant, for sure. For sure, Kevin Durant. Like, I mean, y'all see, like, y'all see, like, he going his rants right now, like, but, like, Outside of that, like, no phones around, no cameras. Oh, man, it's rated R. It's it's rated R, I'm telling you. like, <laughs> And he got, like, the best one-two, like, combo punchline. Like, be so crazy. It be so rude. And, like, you know, sometimes you got to take it because, you know, I talk, like, people will tell you, like, I'm, I'm a fly talker too. So, you know, if if I'm, like, having, having, having like, my way, or things is going well, like, yeah, you're going to hear it from me, too. So, the thing you know, that, I can't blame you, though, because, like, I'm the same way. But like, the, the thing y'all that, know I got, yeah, y'all I, know I got irrational confidence, man. So, I, I do, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, the thing that's frustrating about that, though, is to have a rational confidence, and then you're playing against KD, who's always right. going to get his shot off against you. <laughs> like, right. That you, have, you know what's so crazy? I'm always going to get my shot off, too. <laughs> Damn right. That's how I feel. <laughs> that's how I feel. I'm going to get my shot off, too, so. You know, but that's what make it great, man. Like, that's what make our relationship the way it is, like, right now to this day. Like, you know, because when I first got there, like, KD was actually one of the guys before I even got off the plane. He was the first one to text me. He welcomed me in with, you know, open arms. I think when I first got to OKC, I think I was with, I think I, I was at KD house probably, like, every day. Like, every day, man. So our relationship just grew from there. So it was like. He one of them. He one of them special guys, man. Like outside of all that social media stuff and all that like weird stuff that be going on, he's actually like one of the nicest down to earth guys you probably could meet. You just right. used the phrase irrational confidence. Who are your favorite irrational confidence guys? Because it's something that people associate with you. But if I were to play word association with Dion uh, Waiters about who else is an irrational confidence guy, give me the list. I'm going Alan Iverson. I'm going KD. Uh, well, that's – but both of those have – those are very reasonable confidences given their skill set, right? Yeah, like we were thinking more Eddie House. Mario Chalmers. <laughs> Mario Chalmers. Mar Mario for sure. <laughs> nah, listen. See, like, my old rational confidence come from, like, real life, like, situations. Like, just growing up in the inner city of Philadelphia, like, you know, like, I had to be tough. Like I had to have confidence. I couldn't lack that because I get taken advantage of. Like, you know, like just coming up in in in, in you know the inner city where I seen a lot of stuff where like my mom been shot, my dad been shot, my grandma been shot. I lost my best friend to gun violence at 15. I lost three cousins. You know, in the in, in probably a month three cousins back to back to back like so when i say my 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 i have irrational come mine come from like real life situations where like i had to just go out there and like you know make a way for myself and and come and being though you know that just came with it in the sense of just me just have having to have confidence so i step on the court so it's a lot of different things like why i have irrational confidence mine's just based off like real life 
situations where I've been through a lot in my life, man, just as far as like trauma and stuff like that. So I couldn't fold under, you know, pressure, like, because I felt like my life was so real when I was so young that I, like, I had to grow up fast. I had to, you know, like, do a lot of things as a kid that made, you know, at the time it didn't make sense to me because I'm like, I'm a kid and I was just forced to have to do grown up things like, you know, just being mentally tough and, you know, things like that. I always been like the backbone of my family since I was a kid. So my confidence is like based off real life. So when I play basketball, like y'all may think it's irrational confidence on the court, but it's like, man, it's nothing to me. Like I didn't survive some real life situation that nobody can even think of. So, you know, mine's a little different, man. How old would you say you were when you became a man? Because I imagine all I would say I would say about 13, 14, like man, like you know how hard it is. Like I was a mommy's boy. Like so, you know, like coming up, man, like if my mom went outside that night, I didn't go to sleep until she came back in the house. So it was like, can you imagine like that one night your mom don't come home and you get a phone call that your mom got shot? And you know, as a kid, the first the first thing you hear when you know, when you hear your mom get shot, it's, or you think she passed away, or like she died or something. You, you get what I'm saying? So just getting that call, man, at that age, like 13, bro, it's like, it, it just put a different perspective, like, on me and life and not just taking it for granted and, you know, just having to man up from that time being. And that just really changed me. That just really shaped my life into not taking a lot of things for granted. But just getting a call, man, at 13, saying, like, your mom been shot, bro. It was, like, traumatizing. Like, so I think since 13, I had to grow up. And I was paying bills at, like, 15. You know what I'm saying? So I was already, like, taking care of the house, paying bills for my mom, like, when she couldn't afford it. You know what I'm saying? So it's, like, it's different things where, I, like, it, I go into, like, situations just having, like, irrational confidence because of my real-life situations. We're going to come back with Dion Waiters after this. I like the way that he says it better than the way I say it. I say irrational confidence, but I like what he has. Ill rational confidence. That's exactly yeah. what, that's exactly that's exactly what <laughs> Dion Waiters had. Um it I have to ask a question. I mean, it may be a it may be a dumb it may be a dumb question. Uh, but what was happening, Dion? Obviously, the inner cities are impossible, and you hear the stories, and you've lived the life. But why was everybody getting shot like that? That that resume of people getting shot was awfully long yeah. that you just ticked off. Yeah, um, man, I can't tell you. You know, if if I could, I would. But you know, I'm young at the time. I don't. I'm not really understanding these things and all, and and, and the situation that's happening and why they're happening. But, you know, like, I'm a firm believer. And, you know, sometimes just that's how things go that like you can't control. So, like, that's when I said I said my mom got shot, my father, my grandma. You know, they all survivors. My, my grandma just passed away not too long ago, a couple years ago. from heart attack, But she survived, you know, a headshot. And it's like I, I ask myself, like, why, you know, like, why me? Like, why I'm putting in these certain situations to, you know, have to figure out these things at a young age and just not understanding them. And, you know, when you're playing basketball, like, you really don't get a chance to have time to, you know, sit back and reflect on things because it's constantly moving. It's constantly going. Like, life just keep going. Like, everything's happening so fast. So I think, like, when I got a chance to really sit down and really try to, you know, figure these things out and try to think about it, it's like, that's when you kind of feel it more, when you got like the opportunity to sit down and just think about it. Dion, you've, men you've mentioned reflection, and I've read some of your quotes. You were hosting workouts for scouts trying to make your way back in the league, and maturity was kind of part of the Dion Waiters experience and you got suspended three times down here in Miami yeah. uh, one time famously for an edible incident on a plane ride uh, surrounding yeah. the Denver game that uh, saw you have a panic attack 
on an yeah. airplane, according to reports. So yeah. as you're trying to work your way back, you're doing all this reflection. What have you noticed from your career <laughs> in terms of the talent that you had, the opportunities that you may have wasted, and what's different about you now? Uh, I mean, you know, just going back to that incident, like, you know, you do you do something one time, man, you automatically get, like, this stigma about you. Like, everybody who know me know, Dion, don't, I don't do drugs. I don't do any of that. You know, I was told something. And that wasn't the case. And, uh, you know, it happened. And, like, at the end of the day, bro, I'm glad it happened. Like, because, like, I don't even do that stuff. Like, I'm a leader. Everybody know me. Like, I don't follow nobody. Like, I was always taught to, like, you know, run your own race. And, you know, just probably just at the time, just that whole mental battle of that whole year, not understanding why I'm coming in the situation, why I get suspended the first game. I can't tell you why I got suspended the first game. And um, honestly, I really can't. You know, it just happened. It just came out. And you can't really sit up here and say what really goes on or tell the truth, like, because, you know, it, it's backlash. So, you know, I just roll with the punches, you know, like things that was coming out that wasn't true, that sometimes we don't we don't get a chance to voice our, you know, our side of the story or what happens. Sometimes you just got to take it on the chin. But. Just me going through that whole experience of just not understanding the situation at the time, but knowing that I could have handled it a different way. Like, I didn't always have to, you know, say something or felt like I knew, you know, everything. Sometimes the best thing to do is just shut the hell up and let you, like, you know, I could have let my agent handle certain situations that happened. But like I said, I wouldn't be the man I am today if I didn't learn and grow from them experiences. If I didn't, go through it and reflect on it and figure out where I went wrong at, I wouldn't be up here to sit here. I wouldn't be up here today to tell y'all that, you know, I got better from it. Like, I feel like a, a like it's a blessing in disguise. You know why? Because I'm able to sit up here and tell my son today, like, bro, I have real conversation with him. Like, listen, man, like, you know, like your dad not in the lead because his talent. It was my attitude. It was my character. You know, just, you know, just those those two right there, like, and just thinking this, like, you bigger than you bigger than this. But if I don't go through them situations, I'm not I'm not here to tell my son, you know, the same mistakes that I made. But I'm not going to allow my son to make them same mistakes that I made because he's going to be ten times thousand times better than I was and I could and I could and I and I could promise you that and I sit here and I tell him that all day. Your attitude is not gonna get you nowhere. Like you get all the time in the world. But we gotta fix this now. You get what I'm saying? So that's just a blessing, man. Like I'm able to sit here and tell my son that and when I be hearing it come out my mouth like what the yo like <laughs> you're growing like and I, and like when I'm saying it, it's like wow okay <laughs> Okay, I'm maturing like in the in the big in a good way. So it's like I can't sit up here and say like, man, I should be playing, I should be still doing this. Of course, I think I could, and I and I, you know, I still could play at a high level. I feel like I could still go in there right now and help a team, play off team, whatever. Like I can still, you know, I get buckets. Like that's just a it's just a <laughs> gift that I was given, and um. Uh, but like, if I don't go through these, if I don't go through them, like, them downfalls or the mistakes that I made or them, them, them lessons that you know taught me or you know changed me, that like I feel like, you know, I'm doing a disservice to my son if I don't be able to sit up here and tell him where I went wrong at. And sometimes you just gotta tell the truth to yourself, man. Look yourself in the mirror, and just understand, like, okay, pick yourself up now. You know, you read your wrongs, you read your rights, and you know what's next. And you just got to keep them moving, man. I really love the smile on your face that came over that when you just simply said, I can get buckets. Uh, because you do know that, and, <laughs> and we all know it. It's something that it's something that we all know. It should make you smile like that because it is so, nah, yeah. it is so very nah, true. I really, I, you feel like I really, that's just, it's a gift. Like, And it's like, I'm not. You know, it's just like I was just blessed to do something. And basketball was just one of them gifts. I just was blessed to do it, man. Like, I was doing it for 31 years, so I don't really know nothing else. It's like, 
you know. So, man, I'm just in a position where I just want to help the next generation. I, I want to help a lot of the guys that's very, that's very, very talented. But, you know, the attitude and the character of professionalism, like, I want to be that voice to let them know, man, like, you can have all those tools. And if you if you don't use it the right way, you know, you can find yourself out the league. So I'm glad I went through whatever I went through. I feel like I had to go through it, you know, like, you know, you got to get that. Sometimes you need that. You need that humble, that humble pie. So, you know, don't lose your confidence. Don't lose who you are, but just make adjustments. Like, just make certain adjustments. The quotes that Mike was talking about, one of them was in the Players' Tribune in 2020. That last year with the Miami Heat, I was so irresponsible and immature. I let the Heat down. They were good to me. I did not handle it well at all. Those are words of experience because I don't I don't believe that if I had been interviewing Dion Waiters during that season that that's what he would have said at the time, right? You you're right. All, you're, you're doing that because you had time to sit back and reflect. You're saying you're saying I got on the treadmill, I get in the league, and then you're so busy being great. There's no time to think about anything. You're just right. going full speed, and then next thing next thing you know, you've uh, you feel bad because a situation where the handcuffs were off because they were allowing you to play. What happened there, Dion? What would you say was happening? Uh, I, I don't know. I would say just different emotion, growing pains. Um, it's a lot of, you know, lessons taught, lessons learned. Um, probably just, man, just mentally in a different space. And not really understanding like what was going on at the time and like what it was. So like I understand I had a good situation, man, and it sucked because I was arguably having one of my best years. And I think after the foot injury, man, I just think like everything kind of went downhill a little bit. Like after I, you know, fractured my foot during that 16, 17 season. I think that was 16, 17, 16, 17 season. And it's like at the peak of my career, when I finally get the opportunity that I want, I'm balling. We seventh seed in the playoff. We we go from eleven and thirty to thirty and eleven in the second half of the season. From dead last in, in in the playoff contention to seventh seed, and it's like I break my foot, and it's like I come back now. I'm out of shape. It's like uh, you know D Wade come back. So it's like now you gotta. Kind of like put your career on hold because that was D Wade farewell tour. So now it's like everything was just centered around D Wade, and you know you was glad to be a part of it because that was like your big brother, and that was also something that was on your bucket list. You know, um, you wanted to play with him, but you know around that same year you're still trying to come back from injury. You're not feeling like yourself. Like I said, I was out of shape. I was still getting buckets though. But, you know, <laughs> I was, you know, I was out of shit. But it's like, everything just was, like, tough. It just was, like, a fall. Like, I couldn't get out of it. Like, man, like, and then, like, the following year, 19, like, that 19, 20 year, I, I got back in shape. Jimmy Butler comes down. So now it's like, everything changed. It's like, I don't know, it's almost sort of like they was trying to, you know, just go in a different direction, but, like pit pit rules in place now where it's like you didn't have room to do nothing. So if you did any little thing, it was like you getting in trouble or like they just, you know, put their foot down. It wasn't like that before. So like I don't oh, but know. You know but no, but Dion, you know if you come into Pat Riley out of shape, like you yeah. I don't yeah, know. but I understand that. But it's like I couldn't shake back. It's like I was you know, I was still recovering from my foot. Remind, I was in surgery for seven hours. But I got two screws in my foot. It's not an excuse, but it's like, bro, I had, I had a real, real injury. Like, take a piece of my hip bone, put it in my foot. I got scoped. I was in surgery for seven seven hours. So it's like, I had a real injury. I didn't I didn't walk for nine months. Like, it was like, it was tough. So. Imagine, like, just not even feeling like yourself, and you know you don't feel like yourself. 
and you got to check your weight every week. Now you're looking at your weight every week. Now it's reminding you that you're fat. So like, <laughs> man, been there. Like it was, just, it was just tough, man. It was just tough. Yeah. Like, but so. you had a, Dion. You had a nice career. I mean, you're just casually flashing the half a milli Richard Milley. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> you got that half a million on your wrist. I've seen it. Uh, it Dion, Orange it's great, it's great gold. seeing you. I, That's an adult, right? I, I am so... Oh, no, you know, this, this is <laughs> <for sure. laughs> Woo! I am Orange, so man. mad that you we know. can't continue this interview, that we're out of time. Good seeing you, Dion. Thank you for being on with us, you sir. Too. Nice seeing you again. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. A critic writes in... I've listened for 10 plus years and I understand that things change, but man, has this show gone downhill. I don't care about politics no matter what side you're on, but this show has become a lot of politics and a little sports. Who wants to walk up a hill? Much easier to walk down a hill. That is true and obvious. Not a, uh, not a point that it's illuminating in any way. No, I feel like it is a good point. That guy who tweeted that, I bet he doesn't want to go walk up a hill. Did he say anything about how I'm doing so far? Uh, not yet. Lucy, happy to have you here. Uh, I think you're killing it. Uh, but Thank what's you. been happening around here for many, many, many months now, and I'm going to say it's more, I'm going to go, I'm going to say it's years now. The criticisms have steadily been pouring in. Too many people at microphones, not the same show. Not the people uh, that I'm used to doing the show with. And so what I tried to do, and I think it was successful, I think I, instead of trying to do the harder thing, which is make everyone improve and make the show improve, what I did was the Samson Summer. I lowered your expectations, so that when I came back, you missed me today. You were thrilled. Me, this, your enemy for so long. Oh, he's getting so old. He sees a hit and run, and he drives 38 miles an hour, and he squints looking at the license plate, and he doesn't get it, and the, the hit and runner drives away because he's old. I hit you with just a few episodes of David Sampson, and the number of you who said, it's been four months of Samson. This is too much Samson. The number of texts I sent from the hospital to people, it's been six shows. He's done six shows. Did feel like six weeks. I'm not allowed. I'm not even taking vacation. It's not vacation. I'm going away because I have to be away from here to attend to things. And I gave you the sickness of Samson, to lower your expectations because making the show better is too hard. I want to play for you some sound from Big Baby Davis. I miss him as a player. I miss him as a quote. I just love that that's his nickname, too. We've accepted it. Big Baby. Big baby. Yeah. <laughs> it is, I, I think it's a great nickname. Is it not? Would you not agree that it's, it's a great nickname and because it's physically apropos. If there was a, a, a not a toddler, an infant who was a little heavy in the crib, not 6'7", obviously, and not 300 pounds, but he does look like a big baby. Outside of the Greek freak, I don't think there's a better descriptive nickname in basketball. Big Baby's perfect. Descriptive. What are you doing with descriptive? I've maintained that the best uh, nickname in basketball was AK-47, Andre Karolenko, number 47, because that's he was not descriptive. A, a Russian weapon. But you're talking about because Greek freak. He's Greek and he's a freak. Yeah. But it's, I think Big Baby's better than that. As, yeah. Well, certainly it. if we're doing descriptive. Right. There that's I why I'm saying it. descriptive. But, but, but Greek Freak isn't a great descriptive nickname. It's, you either think it's a great nickname or not a great nickname. A throwaway, a throwaway line in what he did, it, we're just like really criticizing it. He, he just threw that. He's just like, behind Greek Freak, he thought we wouldn't even stop on that. And we're Absolutely. Like, Wait, let's go back. This is not the space that's I a terrible we'd stop nickname. on at all. <laughs> KD hates it, but Slim Reaper was good. It's a great nickname. That's a great he, one. He, he rejected it and killed it by rejecting it. It never caught on, and because it's kind of like Big Baby, it, like it makes sense. But if you say, if you say to myself, you look in the mirror and you say, "I'm Slim Reaper," that doesn't sound like a compliment. Big Baby doesn't sound like a compliment. Well, but Slim Reaper also a great descriptive nickname because 
the physical look of KD is absolutely harrowing if you imagine it with a sickle coming to take your life. That is the, that is the, that is the size and weight of the Reaper. And holy shit, nobody can block his shot because he's, he's 6'10". But that guy, give me somebody in that sport more physically a Slim Reaper, more physically looking like a Grim Reaper that if he walked in here wearing that costume that Bob the Engineer used to wear before he retired, even though we never told anybody that the bucket of death was brought to you by Bob the Engineer in the Grim Reaper costume. What? I just revealed it because he retired. I wanted everyone to know that, that he was very what often... About Bob? <laughs> The person that looks more like the Slim Reaper than Kevin Durant looks like the Slim Reaper is Victor Wembanyama. Oh, if he came in with a Slim Reaper oh, outfit, wow. I'd be like, holy shit. That's, it is pretty good, and thank you for making that the transition because here, is big, here is big baby Davis talking about Wick, uh, Victor Wembanyama. You know what? Uh, the length I probably would have struggled with, but uh, the body, oh, yeah, tomato chest. They saw, you know, that boy looked like a little baby Bambi out there the other night. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, little yeah, baby yeah. giraffe walking yeah. around. You know, I don't think he can handle all this pain, you know. So I definitely would have used my body against that boy. In his defense, in baby, in big baby's defense, I feel like I could back down Wembenyama. I know I couldn't, but just the way he looks, he looks so spittily. We've gone from Tony saying he could back down John Amici I never to said now I Chris be, uh, Cody saying he could back down no, Victor Wembanyama. I say I think, like, just the way he looks, I feel like I could. I know I couldn't. There's a difference there. I think he can Tony step over you. Tony actually thinks he would take John Amici in basketball. I will. He could step over you, but did you, uh, what is the word that you used there? Spittily. It's spindly. Mm. Whatever, man. You knew what I meant. Unnecessary well, correction. Think, you know what? I think he's right. I think you know what? I think he's absolutely right. If you're if I I was doing it, I wasn't doing it for me. I was actually doing it for the audience that arrived. Any moment that I've been hearing for a week that Adnan Verk gets a fifty dollar fine for killing Mel Brooks the last time he, he was did that. on with us he did that. because I didn't correct him on the spot. And so what I'm actually doing as a device is offering the audience, hey, we caught that. That's not the right word. It's the same thing I did with Dion Waiters earlier that I didn't want to leave without comment that he was saying that he had ill, rational com uh, confidence. However, you coming back at me that way has made me know that the mirror does absolutely show me an asshole. I'm the Michael Jordan of getting a word a little wrong. Like, no one does what I just did. Like, no one does that better than me. Of, like, I know the word I want to say, and I even know what it means. I just am going to say it wrong. Put All it, right? Bite me. Put it on the poll. Chris Cody would have been funnier if you said bit me. Put it on the poll at Levitard Show, please. Uh, is Chris Cody the Michael Jordan of getting a word a little bit wrong? I am. Um. I appreciate <laughs> <laughs> I did the joke that you said to do. Yeah, thank just like, you. Like, thank how you. could I implement that? <laughs> um, thank you for mentioning Michael Jordan, though, because it allows me to segue <laughs> into uh, something that happened here recently. Because Larsa Pippen, Scottie Pippen's ex-wife, is now uh, dating Michael Jordan's son. They have a podcast, I think. Uh, yeah, it should be called Jordan and Pippen. We uh, we covered this the other day. It would do it would do very well just on name alone. <laughs> but the other day, we all learned at the same time. As he went to his car, and I want to say TMZ was there, but it wasn't TMZ. It's just people who are around filming people who don't work for TMZ, but then sell a video to TMZ. Michael Jordan was headed to his car and was asked whether he approves of the relationship between Larsa and his son. And his response was just no. And when I say that we all learn this at the same time is because Larsa Pippen now says she's been traumatized by that. And I'm wondering, how did she discover that the same way that we did? I would have assumed at some point somebody would have said, yeah, Michael doesn't love that. His, his son is dating, that in, in all of the internet frenzy that is what famous people deal with, that is now in the news stream. Not that Larsa Pippen belongs 
to Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen or anybody in this equation, but going from TMZ to Larsa Pippen now saying she's been traumatized by learning that he doesn't approve of the relationship surprised me. Did it not surprise you guys? It's scary when your in-laws don't like you. It's scary when Michael Jordan is your in-law in any period. But the point is, when you have a relationship with him, I guess in some factor, you think Marcus was like, Ugh, I don't know if I want to tell my dad that I'm dating Larsa Pippen right now. That's a good That's a good. Uh, it's like, hey, dad, we're on FaceTime. Look who's here. And he's like, what? Just looking at her. And you're like, oh. Well, this they is denied it for a while. They, they, they denied it. They denied it, at least in, in part, one would imagine, because of what it is that we're talking about. I was just, Michael Jordan answering that question was surprising to me because Michael Jordan never does that. How do you think the video, that process, when you have a video and I want to sell it to TMZ, how does that work? Because if I send it to them, then they have it. Yeah. Like, like, do I have to call? Do I get on the phone with somebody wire at you TMZ the money first, yeah. and say, hey, I got this video. I'm not showing it to you yet because I don't want you to then have it. Like, I just am but curious. But they can't run it unless they have permission. Yeah. So yeah. They can't, it's not their property. Yeah. And <laughs> just Semantics. tweet it. Like, send them a DM and say, this is what I've got. Because mm -hmm. they can't take it, like they have to have permission. And then I name my price. Yeah, and you That's name your price. price, and you get rich. I just love, I want to know the negotiations on when TMZ gets these videos. Because if I had a video, like a really good video, you did have one of your father drunk uh, in uh, falling into the bushes. Yeah, I probably could have sold that for more. No one cares about my dad falling in a bush. <laughs> has to be a famous person, Chris. What That's do you mean no one cares about your dad falling into a bush? The line at Moss was how That's long? True. You Wait a minute. I learned what an oaf you were at business because you didn't arrive with enough shirts this at Moss. This was early on, Dan. You this sold before out, I knew. You, your shirt sold out. You ran out I of shirts. I bought 100 shirts. And you and ran out how fast? In like 10 minutes. I could have bought 500 shirts. I and I made like a thousand bucks that like I think like do the math there I could have made five thousand bucks. Wow. And, and how much did you make on showing people the video? Or no, if they bought a shirt, they got to see the right. video. Right, you had to buy a shirt <laughs> to see the video. And at one point, the shirts were gone, and I was just like, "All right, fine, you can look at the video." So the people that bought the shirts <laughs> are like, "What the hell? Man. What kind of scam is this?" <laughs> I was we were young, ah, uh, to be young. That was when we didn't know business. Now we know. <laughs> we got it all figured out. <laughs> I thought for sure you were going to end the segment by getting a word wrong. Damn right. <laughs>